Around 2010, Arcane Studios was not looking too great, having produced no games of their own and only those made for other developers like Ubisoft or Valve, they didn't have a lot of credibility in the gaming industry, and it also didn't help that the games they did make weren't really received well either. However, not long into the new decade, Bethesda would contact them and offer a deal that would change the company forever. Bethesda hired them to create a stealth-based game, and after years of development, this would be known as Dishonored. This game had put them on the map, as the game had received numerous nominations and rewards across various categories, and it gave the team at Arcane a platform to stand on within the gaming world almost as high as some of the giants in the industry today. But in 2014, things would change once again, as while part of the team was busy working on a Dishonored sequel, everyone else was working on something quite bizarre. Prey will always be known as Arcane's first child. This is the first game they were able to create that they wanted to make, not something they were contracted to make. This would lead to the team making this game much differently than the award winning title. Instead of having an expansive world only gated off by levels like Dishonored, they would opt for a larger dynamic world that would constantly adapt and change throughout the game, where players wouldn't have to just think about the challenges within the level itself, but all the obstacles and the map around them. However, lots of decisions led to the game going down the wrong path. In 2011, Bethesda would acquire the intellectual property rights to Prey, the one from 2006. But it wouldn't be much later until they finally used the IP's namesake for a project. At E3 2016, Bethesda would announce a reboot of Prey, which seemed to generate some hype and intrigue. The problem started to arise though, as some were still unaware of the game being a reboot and simply casted it aside, while others were still riding the high of Dishonored and were eagerly waiting for the sequel while not paying attention to anything else. As if things weren't already bad enough, there was disputes over the Prey trademark and Bethesda withheld review copies of the game until the release day, which led to a lot of a negative assumptions about the game's gameplay and its performance. However, after some time, Prey would earn favorable reviews among critics, but it still wasn't enough, as the sales were 60% less than Dishonored 2, and that game was still behind in sales compared to Dishonored 1, so while we don't know actual numbers, they didn't seem very high. This whole synopsis brings me to my actual point. Prey did not receive the love it deserved. I've been playing this game for the past few weeks, and at least within recent memory, it's the best immersive sim and story game I've played in a long time. It's one of the very few games I regret never playing on release. Its story, player freedom, and gameplay all mixed together created this fantastic experience, and it's one that I'll never forget. So today I want to take some time to discuss my experience with Prey, and maybe even convince you to give this game a try just like I did. Without further ado, let's get started. Prey is a complex and mind-bending game, so firstly we need to discuss what it is. Despite what the Steam page says, Prey is a first-person immersive sim. The last word may be a bit foreign to some, so think of games like Deus Ex, Dishonored, and System Shock. The point being that the game provides you with a plethora of options you can use to complete your current objective. Dishonored was universally praised for this style of gameplay, and so was Prey. Sadly, this is as much as I can say. Due to the nature of the game, talking about it anymore would be entering spoiler territory, so I'll be adding a warning now and then once again when we get to the story section. This upcoming portion spoils the intro of Prey, arguably the most important part of the game, so skip to the gameplay section if you still want to listen but want to avoid story spoilers. If you've been watching my content for a bit, then you know this isn't the first time I'm saying this, and it also won't be the last, but the intro, which I consider to be the first hour of any game, is the most important part of the game, and Prey might actually have the best opening hour of a game I've ever played. After picking our preferred gender, we as Morgan Yu wake up in an apartment deep within the city. We get a call from our brother Alex, who wants to meet with us. The apartment has a lot of interactable objects, from bottles to books to our workstation. It's getting us acquainted with the game without even telling us what to do. We can't leave until we put on our suits, so in the meantime, the player can test their controls, their settings, and allow them to get a good feel for the game before they head out. Too many games seem to just jump the player into conflict or obvious tutorials that it seems like you're being dragged alongside the game. Prey is all about providing the player with choices and options, so it seems quite fitting that the very first objective doesn't start until we're ready. We go outside and are told that the helicopter our brother sent is waiting for us. The next two minutes are probably the best two minutes of the entire game. Not only is it because of the unique decision to add 3D in-world text to present the studios in-game, but it's what these two minutes represent. 78 degrees, clear skies all the way.
In a game all about interactivity and creativity, one of the most memorable parts of this game has none of that. All you do is just move the camera, that's all you can interact with, but like I said, it's what this scene represents that makes it so memorable. This small part of the game was able to captivate the player in numerous ways, like the gorgeous views from the helicopter and of course, the music. The song playing in the background is called Everything Is Going To Be Okay. The song conveys a sense of warmth, happiness, and excitement. Like I said, I've been playing this game for the past three weeks, and not a single day has gone by that I haven't listened to this song. This along with the entire soundtrack was composed mostly by Mick Gordon, yes, the one that created the music for Doom. He's clearly a talented composer, and his work on Prey was no exception. We'll talk about that a bit later in the video, but for now, let's continue. After landing the helicopter, we take an elevator, meet with our brother, and then are told to go through a series of tests. This is another tutorial disguised as a test simulation, like picking up objects, hiding, and climbing. Throughout these tests, things start to become a little puzzling. While the researchers assure us we're doing fine, their commentary is quite contradictory. I'm sorry, can someone please explain to me what's happening? Simmons? I installed exactly what Tina brought down. Did you double check? Speaker's still on. I apologize, Morgan. We're having some trouble with the equipment. This comes to a startling halt during our very last test. We're nearly through it. For this next part, I'm going to display an image. I want you to take a good look at it. In a moment, I'm going to ask you what... Uh... Is my coffee? It's empty. Oh my god! Security! Security! So, it was a little unexpected, but this is great now, as the conflict has started and we can finally get into the game. Good morning, Morgan. Today is Monday, March 15th, 2032. I lied, we are back at our apartment. The game is trying to toy with the player. What we saw was 100% real, but because they sent us back to the apartment, it's trying to convince us that everything we saw was fake. Someone or something is screwing with us. What we saw was real, and nothing inside this tiny apartment can convince us otherwise. Since the player has already been here, it's quite easy to know where to go next, which is down the hall to the helipad, except that door isn't there anymore, and the lady we saw out in the hallway is now dead. This sets in a feeling of tension, essentially confirming that what we saw during the test did happen and is in some dream. There is some alien creature in the building and we're being hunted. The issue is that the areas we went down before are gone, and the only way out seems to be the balcony. This is the reason I said skip this part to avoid spoilers. This is single-handedly one of the most powerful and confusing scenes in the entire game. Anyone who has ever played Prey knows about the intro, and it's quite hard to forget. This entire time you were made to believe that you were in some large apartment when in fact you were in some facility being monitored presumably by the researchers from earlier. It's a short but powerful scene that is wonderfully executed. As we walk around the facility, still coming to terms with what we just uncovered, we engage in combat with the Mimic for the first time. It's quite an easy fight, and I'm almost 100% certain the Mimic does not hit you, but rather just runs away. Because of how unique the enemy we face is, having the ability to turn into other objects, we not only have to get accustomed to controls, to combat, but also its attack strategy. For most games, the first enemy is slow, weak, and almost impossible to lose to. However, Prey refused to pull the same tactic and instead put us right into the deep end, showing us how these enemies work and attack. Having them not actually attack us does fall in that same description before, where they're impossible to lose to, but because the enemy is a bit complex and is constantly toying with us by shape-shifting then running away, it's both a perfect display of the basics of Prey's combat, but also making sure the player doesn't get punished for just trying to learn something new. After this, we uncover another secret. The room and the helicopter we rode on is also fake. If we go to the second floor, we can further confirm our suspicions once again, as the walls created a simulation that made it look like we were in a helicopter being flown across the city. It's quite clear this entire intro was made to invoke numerous feelings. 
themselves, from confusion to mystery to even questioning everything we see. These emotions and feelings we have will be key as we continue the game into the story. Progressing further into the level, we once again get introduced to more combat, except this time it's a little different. It's now a 4v1 room filled with a ton of objects. These mimics could be anywhere and anything. I also like the small detail of the chair in the middle of the hallway, as it seems way too out of place to just be a chair, however it really is just a chair, making you go crazy thinking how is that not a mimic? This continues to bury deep into your mind as now you start expecting duplicates of items, assuming that they may actually be real until the mimic finally reveals itself. It's also here where the game provides you with a few options of escape. There's a door hatch as well as a regular locked door. This is the start of balance the game tries to achieve, and this balance will continue throughout the game and other aspects. We can head right into the hatch and leave. We escape the mimics and live to fight another day, but if you face your fears of the mimics, you can push into the main office and grab the keycard. You will more than likely need to face all the mimics to get there, but you'll be rewarded with a way out, all the items they dropped, and the confidence in your combat capabilities. But the game doesn't want you to be too proud of yourself, as once you escape, you meet another alien much different than the one we just faced. It's here where we get our first gun, the glue cannon. This is by far the most versatile weapon I've ever used. The glue gun's primary function is to glue things it touches, so now we can freeze the mimics and allow us to get a sneak attack bonus against them. While this is great, we will discover later it has way more uses than this. In typical fashion, we also get introduced to the abilities and skills we'll be upgrading by using neural mods. I'll explain this more in the gameplay section, but this is where they first appear. To our right is the door we need to go through to exit this facility, or at least one room of the facility. This place is called the lobby, so maybe we could use this area to escape out the front doors, except for the very final time we are being lied to. So not only were we not in a real apartment, the helicopter ride was also fake, and everything we thought was real was not, and to top it all off, we aren't even on Earth, we're on a fucking space station. All of this, everything we have experienced from the very second of the game, was in space near the moon. I'm really hoping that if you haven't played Prey, you aren't watching this part of the video, because the emotions you'll feel in this intro are unlike any other. That's why I honed in on that song from the beginning. The song was even lying to us, painting us this picture that the game was going to be this bright and beautiful world. I've Obviously not everyone was going to believe it was as sunshine and rainbows as it seemed, but I feel like no one would have guessed it would have been this deep in betrayal and deception. I also love the irony of the song title everything is going to be okay, when in fact it's the complete opposite. As you may expect, tons of time went into this part of the game, especially with the glass breaking scene. There's a documentary from the people at No Clip where they talked with the team about this intro specifically. I won't say everything is to completely steal from the video if you want to watch it yourself, however some incredible discoveries are brought up during the interviews. From the very beginning, the devs were hinting at this mystery, as when inspecting the floor, you could find marks as if walls or items were being moved. They also placed the fish tank outside the room specifically near the area where you pick up the wrench. The devs also purposely made the tank and its fish bright so that the player might be inclined to hit it with the wrench. When the player hits the glass, it breaks, meaning that the other glass will break if it's hit with the wrench, which of course leads to the glass breaking scene. The one thing the team at Arcane wanted from the very beginning was for us to break the glass. The emotional feeling is much more impactful when we uncover the mystery ourselves, and something I didn't notice until watching this video, that the fish tank was actually a viable option of leaving the room. You don't get to have the cinematic feeling that you would get normally, but it's another way of a Escaping. One thing that definitely needs to be brought up is the amount of skill that's needed to actually conceptualize and make this thing come to life. This whole thing is fake, so things need to be made that way. In most games, an elevator is used to load and remove assets to give the player the feeling that they're actually going up and down in an elevator, except Prey takes this a little bit too literally. The only thing that moves in the elevator is the number counting down. Everything else is moving around you so that it gives the illusion that you're actually moving down a few floors. In a way, you could see the researchers as the developers, and Morgan as us. The devs are trying to convince us that what they built is real, just like the researchers built the facility to convince Morgan what he's seeing is real. Prey's intro is by far one of the most iconic intros in gaming due to its ability to deceive the player, but also never outright tell the player what is real or not, but instead let them figure it out for themselves. We didn't need to screw with the workstation and discover that the looking glass technology they used was to fool us, but it feels better when you're rewarded for doing something yourself, rather than when the game motions you towards something against your own volition. Like I said earlier, the intro is the most important part of the game. This is the area of time that most players will end up reaching. While not many may make it to the ending, those who have purchased the game will see the intro, and if you can hook them here, then you might be able to hook them for the rest of the game. And Prey's intro goes above and beyond to do just that by letting the player do all the work. 
technically we are now finished with the intro, but there is still one last thing to do, and that's to go to Morgan's office. Upon entering the office, we watch a message that Morgan left for himself until our brother purposely interrupts it so we don't discover the truth. This is where we officially start the next chapter of the game. I'll get into that message later in the story section because now we can talk about the gameplay. So Prey's gameplay I feel is more akin to a survival horror game, once again something the Steam page won't tell you. You go around and loot for materials, ammo, and other equipment while dealing with the enemies in your way. Most of the time you'll just be barely getting by with the equipment you have, which is why I've always considered it at least a survival game. The horror part is subjective depending on how much this will terrify you. Regardless, it definitely has the elements of a survival game. You can even enable certain survival options like traumas, weapon integration, and oxygen level if you want. All of this is well and good, but what's the actual gameplay loop? What are you going to be doing throughout the game? This is a little hard to answer due to the many different variables, but at its most basic form, you'll be searching desks, boxes, trash cans, tables, pretty much anywhere for trash items. You can then take these items to the two most important objects in the game, the recycler and the fabricator. Each item in the game has a specific material in it, such as organic, mineral, synthetic, or exotic. All these items can be placed in the recycler and turned into those materials. You can then take those materials to the fabricator to make certain plans. You can unlock these plans by finding specific fabricator plans scattered throughout the station. This at its core is the most basic form of its gameplay. Finding items, turning them into materials, then using those materials to make new items. While scavenging for supplies, you won't be just finding random trash, there could be things like med kits, neural mods, but more importantly, new weapons. Prey has certain weapons that are very standard in games like this, a pistol, a shotgun, and a melee weapon. But Prey also adds more unique weapons, like a stun gun or Q-beam, but there's also some extremely well thought out grenades and two of the coolest weapons to be put in a game like this. The grenades are incredibly unique. There is no typical frag grenade or incendiary that does damage. They're all situational grenades that are extremely powerful. The first one you might come across is the recycler charge. It works like a mobile recycler machine. Anything you throw at it can be sucked inside and turned into materials, and this goes for you and the enemies. This on the surface is pretty good for gaining more materials. You could stack some items together and throw a recycler for some easy materials, but nothing in this game should ever be seen as simple. What's stopping me from throwing this at a door I can't unlock, or a box that's too heavy to move? It gets the materials, yes, but it also opens up new paths I couldn't before. This is what Prey is all about, using the simple mechanics of an item to do bizarre things, and I think that's truly what its gameplay loop entails. The other grenades, while not as creative as the recycler, are still worth keeping. Typhon lures are used to lure enemies away from an area, EMP charges can disable power to a box, allowing you to not get shocked or disable an electric enemy, and no wave transmitters can disable Typhon abilities, making mimics come out of hiding or just stopping them from attacking. All these grenades can be placed as well, so you could even lay traps for the Typhon. Why bother killing the enemy yourself when they could just walk over a recycler and kill themselves? And that's truly the fun of this game's combat. Yes, shooting an enemy and killing them using conventional means is still fun, but when you use the equipment you have in different ways, it's much more enjoyable, and they not only encourage this style of gameplay, but you could be rewarded for doing so. The glue cannon and the bolt caster are perfect for this explanation. The bolt caster is seen as a utility weapon. It literally shoots foam bolts, so obviously this won't help us kill anything, so it helps us in other ways. If you have the right angle, you could shoot the workstation screen so that the doors can unlock and allow you to get inside. It's a genius weapon that continues to hone in on the play how you want gameplay, but like I said, it's quite obvious from the moment you pick it up what it's actually used for. The glue gun is a different story. The first thing we see of the glue gun is a mimic trapped in glue, so this tells us it's a combat weapon, however it's way more versatile than that. As multiple times, we can see these makeshift stairs and walls full of them. This is showing the player that what you are seeing is possible to do. The best example I can show was when I was at the very top of the station. To get into this office, you need to take the gravity lift, but it was out of power and I couldn't use it. But with a little bit of glue, I was able to climb up the side and get into the office without even needing the code. This is the main reason I love the glue gun so much. It's because it's a versatile weapon with endless possibilities disguised as a combat weapon. Another nice display of detail is that every weapon minus the bolt caster has a little display of ammo, and I think that's wonderful as the HUD for this game is very minimal with only the three bars at the bottom being consistent throughout the whole game. But it doesn't even stop at the weapons, as there are still abilities and chipsets you can unlock. The chipsets are these pieces you can attach to your suit and psychoscope that can provide upgrades like discovering where hidden mimics are and adding extra resistance to certain attacks. They are minor but meaningful upgrades, as they are passive buffs. For the skills, originally you start out with three human trees. These can upgrade things like health, stamina, and strength, but eventually you'll get three more trees, all of which have Typhon abilities. Using the power of the Typhon against them, you can change the entire situation in front of you. I won't go over everything 
individually, but there is a large variety of them, like a basic damage ability called Kinetic Blast, or even being able to summon your own phantom from a corpse called Phantom Genesis. All of these abilities work seamlessly into the gameplay, allowing for your creativity to shine. There are many ways that you can utilize all these abilities and options at the same time, and it really encourages you to play your own way. All of these abilities, though, have to be bought using Neural Mods, so everyone will be in different spots at certain points. You can either find the Neural Mods or find the Fabrication Plan to make some. If someone takes the time to scavenge the station, then they'll be pretty well equipped to deal with most situations head on, but if you didn't find any, then you'll need to be more creative in your approach. Even if you do have lots of Neural Mods, it all depends on what you chose. Typhon abilities are nice and very effective at dealing with the Typhon, but use too many and the turrets on the station may mistake you for one. With that in mind, maybe you don't want to use the Typhon abilities, but then you're losing out on a plethora of options those abilities give you. This is what I meant by that balance earlier, choosing to either dedicate more time to search areas for loot and maybe finding neural mods, or skipping it entirely and missing out on beneficial upgrades. It makes the experience different from other players and leads to a lot of those I didn't know that moments, where even after the third playthrough you might still find new ways to explore a location or take an enemy down. However, that balance doesn't just affect the exploration, but also its combat. The game constantly makes you feel inferior, then gives you strong weapons and upgrades only to make you feel inferior once again. In the beginning, we had nothing but a wrench against the Typhon, but then we were given the glue gun. Now we have something to combat them. But then the game introduces phantoms, and while you may think it's easy, a wrench and a glue gun is not going to be enough. But not to worry, as the game will give us pistols and shotguns and upgrades, but then the enemies will also get stronger with different variations, with fire or electricity, some can create clones, ones that can be invisible, you get my point. Rarely in this game did I actually feel powerful. I was by definition a powerful being, but because the enemies were getting stronger and more diverse, I was struggling at certain points. However, I think this is a good thing. If everything was easy to kill, then what's the point of being creative when running and gunning is both easier and faster? Enemies will also respawn when you load back into an area, so if you go from the lobby to deep storage then back to the lobby, newer enemies will be there. It's not exactly like traditional respawning, because it's newer enemies or stronger versions of current enemies, so it's shows how the ship acts like an ecosystem, where enemies will wander into areas you've cleared out. On top of not feeling powerful, I never really felt safe either. Games like Resident Evil, for example, have a safe room hidden away from the danger, where no enemies can get inside. It also has a save station and most likely a box with all your gear. You could keep the game running and walk away from the game without any worry, as nothing can enter. But with Prey, I can only think of one spot where I felt this way, which was the main elevator. None of the typical areas are obviously safe. I can't just pick a room and stand there, which is to be expected. There are lots of areas, though, that have permanent locks on them. You can lock the door permanently and nothing will get inside, but this isn't some typical enemy. Obviously, the Typhon are different. Not only can the mimics be literally any item in the room, many phantoms have hidden behind desks and doors without even me noticing. I was originally going to add Morgan's office to this list as well, but at least to my knowledge, Morgan does not have a lock on his office door, and I paid the price for this as a phantom that was searching for me had just walked right in. The elevator is the only place in the game where you can feel safe until they spawn a phantom in there to try to toy with you. Not feeling safe is a terrifying feeling, but it's accurate to what's going on. You're trapped on a space station where the alien species roaming the halls outnumber you greatly, so you should feel terrified, and it's a nice correlation to the game's title, Prey. The Typhon aren't the prey here, we are the prey, and that's why at all times you never truly feel safe and powerful when playing. Many games make the player feel weak by giving them nothing to defend themselves with, but not many games can pull this off while also giving the player dozens of weapons and abilities, and I think that deserves a lot of respect. The gameplay is great, but what really ties this all together is the actual station itself. Talos 1 is a wonderfully made setting for the game. The station is both beautiful inside and outside, and the fact that you can go outside the space station was a great decision as it complements the travel aspect of the game. In the very beginning, not every area of Talos 1 will be unlocked, but after a few main quests, eventually you'll have free access to the entire station. However, due to its design, you can't simply go where you want. Certain sections are only available from other sections. Prey combats this problem by providing three fast ways to go around the map. You have the main elevator that takes you from the Arboreum, Lobby, and Life Support. This large tunnel called the Guts, which connects the cargo bay, psychotronics, and shuttle bay to the Arboreum. And lastly, the exterior that connects a majority of the areas on Talos 1 together. All of these ways of travel are beneficial in their own way, but also have some hurdles the player must overcome during or before its use. The main elevator is by far the preferred option, since it's fast and connects the three main sections of the station. But to even start the elevator, you have to destroy a telepath, not only an enemy you have 
been faced yet, but the arena for the area is so tiny it's hard to find any cover. The guts can be very useful, especially from the top all the way to the bottom, but the guts is filled with enemies and is also very dangerous. And the exterior of Talos is quite safe, minus a few enemies, but you do actually have to find the airlocks in their respective places first in order to enter the area. So this isn't for discovering new areas, it's for going to areas you've already gone to. As you'll notice, none of them overpower each other. Personally, I did use the elevator the most, but each option does have its benefits, and because none of them overpower each other, you can simply bypass the issues by just using one for the entire game. Besides the amount of options for fast travel, if you want to call it that, having even one of these would be great. These areas are large and filled with life. Not literally, but you get what I mean. There are multiple floors of rooms to explore, so it can be quite tedious having to go from one end of the station to the other without any assistance. But more importantly, they make sense. This leads me to my next point, which is that the areas are not only gorgeous and expansive, but they feel like they belong. Why wouldn't you have an elevator on a space station? If my knowledge is correct, this space station is 700 meters tall. That's almost as high as the tallest building in the world. Climbing that many steps would probably kill people from exhaustion before they even reach their destiny. Nation. Each of these rooms serves a purpose, not only for the player, but for the station itself. The space station is separated into three main sections, the executive, research, and engineering branch. All the engineering locations are at the bottom. This is where all the hardware, equipment, and maintenance facilities exist. There is the power plant, which holds the reactor that powers the entire ship. The cargo bay is responsible for shipment processing, and life support handles all the air and water filtration systems. This is the core of the station, as nothing can function properly without these working. So you can just look at this place as metaphorically holding the station together, like glue. The middle is the research division that has the largest number of rooms, most of which relate to experimentation. My favorite part about this areas that they were made for specific reasons. It's not just some science wing that exists that has everything and anything. Talos 1 has separate areas dedicated to specific types of research. It's got an area for neuromods, an area for typhon research, and another for hardware and weapons. The last section is the executive division, where the crew quarters, arboreum, and deep storage are. The deep storage is used for storing all the station's research. The arboreum has gardens for botanical experiments and is just gorgeous to look at thanks to the windows surrounding it so you can see the ever-expanding universe. All of these areas also have at least one fabricator and recycler and even a security station. Seeing as this station is used to get the best results fast for their research, they need all the equipment they need within the same building. The security station also has utilities that the security would only need to know, like the map of the area, the status of the escape pods, and even where the crewmates are on the ship since they're all wearing tracking bracelets. The best example though of a believable environment has to be the crew quarters. There are crew cabins and recreational services scattered throughout this area of the station. Some of the crew have separate rooms, but some just sleep in bunk beds, but within these specific rooms are things that complement the person living there. A few of the crewmates are actually a part of a D&D group, so those players will have the game's books or sheets based on their character in their room or on their workstation. The game is also displaying a sense of hierarchy that is respected amongst the station's inhabitants, as there's actually a gravity lift that can take you to the executive suites. I've always said that if a game's setting seems like it could function normally without the need of the player, then they did a good job. And Arcane really took the time to develop this not only gorgeous but believable space station that doesn't just stop at the locations of the areas, but the areas themselves. Things aren't perfectly in order and are normal. There was literally just an outbreak. So random garbage on the floor, a door being unlocked, experiments left unfinished, all of it makes sense. And then there's also the amount of effort that went into not only making the locations look great and feel real, but also making it fun from a gameplay perspective. There are pipes going across the rooms that we can use to spy on the Typhon. We can go into vents connecting other areas and ignore the Typhon. All of this needs to be taken into consideration when making Talos 1, because it doesn't matter how good it looks if the player doesn't enjoy playing, then they won't enjoy the game. Everything we've discussed so far is great on its own, but what ties it all together is the music. Praise music is simply wonderful. I've already talked about the one in the intro and mentioned that praise music was mostly composed by Mick Gordon, and this is actually the most depressing part about this game. Prey never got any nominations for its music, and while Mick Gordon has done press conferences on his music for Doom, none of them were made for Prey. I just wish I was able to understand the thought process behind the instruments and the equipment he used, but that sadly won't happen. Regardless, Prey has some incredible music that fits for the given situation. There are exploration tracks and combat tracks like any typical gaming soundtrack, and also other songs that you can only hear in-game on the speakers.
You'll notice for certain songs like Typhon Voices or No Gravity that the songs aren't strong like a combat theme, but they also aren't some calming ambience, they're sort of a mix of both. The game is creepy and terrifying, so the music should reflect that. Weirdly enough, the song Semi-Sacred Geometry, while it's sung by a woman in the game, it's actually sung by a guy named Matt Pearsall in the official soundtrack. I genuinely have no reason why this is the case. One big problem I have with the soundtrack, though, is that it's just too short, only having around 14 songs. Now, that number could seem fairly average to some, but it's not really the number of tracks per se that bothers me. It's the fact that there is a ton of music not put in the official soundtrack, and it's upsetting because some of this is arguably the best in the game. <laughs> If you've played Prey, there's no doubt in my mind that you've heard this music while playing, and that's why it makes it all the more upsetting. It's just confusing why this is not a part of the official soundtrack, but I guess we'll never know. The only thing that remains of the original game is its story. Once again, spoiler warning ahead, if you don't want to hear stuff about the story, then skip ahead to the DLC. So instead of going back to where we left off in the intro, some background knowledge is necessary. These are the typical who, what, where, when, why questions that are required to give the story actual meaning and explain how things got to where they are. Prey's world is like ours, except in Prey, the space race between Russia and the United States accelerated much faster than ours. During an investigation mission regarding a shuttle that went missing in 19. 1960, two cosmonauts would relay their video feed to the Russian Space Command and capture the very first Typhon. This was immediately labeled the state secret and was never shared with anyone until 1962, when Russia would ask the US President John F. Kennedy to assist in containing the threat. History buffs may recognize that in our world, JFK would be assassinated a year later, but in Prey's universe, that assassination was a failure, and JFK lived through that day in history. Eventually, the US would start building a giant space station so that they could study the Typhon, and while successful for a while, the Typhon broke out and killed everyone on the ship. The station would lay dormant for a while until a newly made mega corporation called Transtar would purchase it, and in a few years, create Talos 1. Transtar is led by an anonymous board of directors that no one knows about except the two faces of the company being Morgan's parents, who are Catherine and William Yu. Eventually, his brother Alex would become the CEO of the company and be the head of Talos One. He would then eventually convince Morgan to join the Talos One research team, to which Morgan accepted. Fast forward to where we left off, after getting to Morgan's office, we play the video that was saved on our computer. Morgan goes on to explain that they've been testing new neural mods with Typhon DNA, so that the neural patterns of both a Typhon and a human brain could connect. The only problem is that when you try to uninstall these neural mods, the user loses all the memories during the time it was implanted. So, hypothetically, if you put in the Neuromod and then uninstalled it a month later, you would lose every memory you had for the past month. To circumvent this issue, they've developed a method of getting people back up to speed, but if they skip that process, you could force someone to live one day for their entire life, which is exactly what happened to Morgan, but for three whole years. While watching the rest of the video, Morgan goes on to explain something, but is interrupted by Alex and refuses to let us finish the video until he can explain himself. Obviously, we're not going to listen, so we leave the office and try to reset the power to the looking glass. It's important when making a story to not only have a strong beginning and end, but give the player actual reason. Some RPGs can struggle with this concept and not give a player a reason to play the story other than the shiny loot at the end. Because if we think about things from the perspective of our created character, what's stopping us from doing the task we were given? Answers like loot or new armor doesn't make sense, because that's what we the player want, not what our character wants. Fallout is always a great example that I tend to reference a lot. Since the protagonist wants to find their son, they aren't going to ditch their kid and take up a new life as a farmer. That's their own son. So it's a perfect motive for the protagonist to venture into the wasteland. The good thing about 
prey is that they have created an environment where the opposite won't ever happen. Our motive as Morgan is finding our brother, and finding a way off the ship. Prey perfectly displays a current short-term goal and a long-term goal. Alex is our brother, so we obviously want to make sure he's okay, but also question him, as assuming he stays true to his word, we may discover why he never gave our memories back. And if possible, our long-term goal could even be furthered if we complete the short-term goal. However, after this, the main story does hit a low point for a while. The quests are a bunch of backtracking and retrieving items. The whole experience isn't all bad, since the gameplay will take the reins for the time being until you get to the quest, so when you're playing and going from quest to quest with combat in between, it's great, but if we analyze the quest just by itself, it's honestly quite boring. After we leave Morgan's office, we head to the hardware labs to reinstall the looking glass, then head back to Morgan's office to hear the final part of the message. After the message, we go to Psychotronics to get the psychoscope before going to the guts, to the arboreum, and then into the deep storage before we realize deep storage can't be opened without a passphrase, so we go to the crew annex to get the password, head back to deep storage except Alex locks us in, then we gotta grab data vaults and try to escape, which causes us to get shot in space, with the only entrance being the cargo bay where all the crew is holed up. That was about half the story summed up in a few seconds. There are obviously conversations that keep you interested in the story, but the amount of backtracking and fetch questing is insane. Like I said, when it works together with the gameplay, it's wonderful, as the gameplay and exploration make going to all these areas fun, especially since most of them are new areas you haven't visited yet, but if we just analyze the story by itself, then it's clear that it's boring. During this time, the player will discover that Morgan hasn't talked once, despite having a voice actor for the role, and these weird cutscenes during certain parts of the game. These are quite vital to the main story, so keep these in mind for later. During this story, you'll encounter a few crewmates that you can talk to. They all seem fairly nice, but there are emails and audio logs that make you and your brother out to be not the nicest of people. So given the context, why would you help these people at all? Especially when you realize that they were willing to look the other way while one of their own members was subjected to constant experiments. Now given the amount of people and how large the ship is, it's fair to assume not everyone knew, but clearly some people did know, and since we don't know who, this action sort of labels all of them being the problem, not just a few people. The game plays into this idea as you'll receive side quests that make you go out of your way to do some random task. One of the researchers, Dr. Igwe, is trapped in a storage device and is running out of air. If we save him, he's thankful for our help and will be stationed at Morgan's office. He'll then give you the task of retrieving a music sample of a famous musician. Dr. Igwe claims it's the last living part of him, and with it we could still be able to hear this man's work. It's completely irrelevant to the main plot, and makes you go out of your way to do so. These play into the mindset of how you would see the researchers after discovering what they put you through, and it's not only extremely important for the story, but an incredible way of giving the player the freedom to choose. Another wonderful quest is about the chef in the crew quarters. You can find him hiding in the kitchen from some Typhon. His name is William Russell, but if you search around, you'll notice that Will's voice and face do not match the person in front of you. Originally, I thought this was a glitch or an oversight by Arcane until the chef rewarded me with the gear in the fridge and then trapped me inside. He is actually an escaped volunteer and is trying to get revenge on us. Not only is the concept of this quest great, but just starting it is even better. Once you've escaped the fridge, he leaves and you won't find him. You'll eventually have to follow a breadcrumb trail of clues that could lead you to him, but while doing this and even just exploring the ship in general, you could trip a recycler charge and get killed. He has left traps everywhere on the ship, and you'll have no idea where they are unless you look really close. The ending of this quest was also fairly well done, where he tries to get you one last time, but it fails and you end his life. Someone else you'll encounter early in the game is January and December. Both are operators, just like the ones we see throughout the station, except these were made by Morgan after he discovered he was being subjected to constant testing. There's also a possible October and November, according to some notes, so it seems like Morgan would discover that he was being tested on, then make backups of his mind so he could catch himself up to speed. The reason why there's so many is probably because Morgan has a chance to be different. So Morgan made October to catch himself up to speed, then when he made November to catch the other up to speed with a better plan, and on and on until we get January. This is backed up by what December and January's end goals are. January's end goal is blowing up the base along with the Typhon on the station, but December's is to hop into Alex's escape pod and leave, dooming everyone. So that leads me to believe that there were multiple times Morgan changed his plan after hearing the previous Morgan's original plan. Knowing this, we can continue with the plan, or the other alternative is to deploy a null wave device. This functions like the null wave grenade, but will eliminate all the Typhon on the ship. After a few more story quests of talking to Alex and retrieving things, you're about to choose an ending and finish the game until Prey throws one final wrench in the plans, which is Dahl. Dahl was hired by Morgan's parents to wipe out everyone on the station, including Alex and Morgan. He even comes equipped with his own army of military operators. The decisions you can make during this part of the quest is fantastic and very expansive, but it's also unpleasant. There are numerous ways this quest can end. 
Dahl attempts to deceive you by acting as a hurt scientist named Luther Glass. This is to lure you into a trap and kill you. He'll then try to shut off the oxygen to the ship, killing the crew unless you stop him. He is actually in the next room, and you can not only stop the oxygen from depleting, but also kill him if you want to. However, if you save Dr. Igwe, he offers an alternative, which is to knock him out and wipe his memory. Since he's the only one with the skills to fly the shuttle he came in on, you could wipe his memory and make him escort the crew off the station before he realizes he was being played. If you don't find him in the other room, you can also find him at the Arboreum trying to kill Alex. Like I said, the quest is incredible, and so expansive that you would have to run through it multiple times just to get everything done. What ruins this quest, though, is his operators. Dahl's military operators not only have the health, but they have the numbers. They are strong, they hit hard, and there's a lot of them. They're not like the Typhon, where you can come up with routes and ways around them. They aren't even like the corrupted operators, because there is never this many at one time. What makes things worse is that most of his quests involve a time limit, so you have to act fast and quick while also being lasered by a dozen operators. While I did try to fight back in the beginning, I pretty much gave up almost immediately and just ran through the quest trying to ignore them. It goes against what this game is about, outsmarting your opponent and using the abilities and weapons you have at your disposal to turn the tide of battle in your favor, but not once did I ever feel like I had the upper hand in any engagement. Now that we have covered just about everything, we can finally talk about the ending. As long as you do either January or Alex's ending, which is using the Null Wave device or blowing up Talos 1, you will get the ending. December's ending with the escape pod gives you a game over, not an ending. It also clues you into what's going on. Assuming you're like me and didn't do this ending first, you're in for a wild surprise. After the ending, we get the credits, then a black screen which transitions into the after credit scene, which is the real ending of the game. Everything we did was a simulation, and what we went through was a reconstruction of Morgan's memories when the Typhon actually attacked the crew of Talos 1. We're also being judged based on our actions, which are a few key features. To get a good review, we need to not kill lots of crew members, kill the imposter chef, spare the volunteer prisoner, save Dr. Igwe and Makaya, and do their respective quests. If you did these well enough, then you succeed. If you fail all across the board, they'll kill you immediately. I know I haven't discussed a few of these choices, so allow me to explain. Later in the game, you'll find most of the crew in the cargo bay. They want your help by killing the Typhon and setting up turrets to defend them. If most or all of them die, then you will fail this part. The last one is a toss-up in terms of my personal feelings, because we find a prisoner locked in a test chamber. We can either kill him and get a lot of exotic material, or let him live and he'll give us the code to the armory. You could also save beforehand, get the code, then revert to last save, and open the armory, which is what I did. Regardless, you're being graded on your moral compass and if someone like him should die or not. You can read his file and discover that he did some illegal things to kids. I refuse to elaborate any further on that statement. Assuming I couldn't save Scum, I would have easily killed him because of his crimes, but that is a bad grade on the test and the only one I received. The reason we're being graded is because Morgan did save the people of Talos 1 through some means, but the Typhon still made it to Earth. Alex is trying to save humanity by building a bridge between the Typhon and humans. Instead of doing what he originally did, which was putting Typhon DNA into humans, which is the Neuromods, he wants to instead take the human DNA and put it into a Typhon. Which is why we were put in the simulation, to determine if we showed enough empathy and care for the crew aboard Talos 1, despite all the testing Morgan went through and the fact that we're technically a phantom. If we succeed, then we're given two options. We can join Alex and the rest, or kill Alex and become like every other Typhon, dooming the world. It's a wonderful ending, and something I did not see coming. There were some signs that led to this conclusion, but nothing was concrete enough for me to know. No. It was extremely well made and planned out, so that the breadcrumbs of what's going on, like the flashbacks and the numerous discussions about being humans with emotions, were shared, but in a perfect way that the player did not see coming, but only realized what it was when the moment was right. Putting it simply, it's just genius storytelling. Prey is not without its issues. Individually, the beginning and end were fantastic and some of the highlights of my playtime, but the middle did sour the experience a bit. If you wanted to buy Prey for just the story, despite what I just said, I would still give it my recommendation, as the beginning and end are just that good. In 2018, with the release of Survival Mode and New Game Plus, Arcane would also release its first DLC called Moon Crash. There was another DLC released months later called Typhon Hunter, which is a 5v1 versus mode where one person is Morgan, tries to kill the other five players who are hiding his mimics. I was going to cover this DLC as well, but not only could I not actually figure out where to play the DLC, I'm assuming the servers are long dead by now anyway. Regardless, Moon Crash is way different than Prey. Mooncrash is Prey, but if it was a roguelike. 
A roguelike was the last genre I expected to play in a game like this, so it came as a surprise. Funny enough, this would also be my first experience with roguelikes. I've heard people say Deathloop was a roguelike, but I've also heard people argue it's a roguelite. But in terms of the actual popular roguelikes of the genre, such as Hades or Risk of Rain, I've never played any of them. And just in case you're like me and haven't touched this genre either, it usually encompasses things like permadeath, randomized levels, among other key features. I was definitely a little nervous going into this, but I was intrigued to play it because I've never played something like this before, and to summarize my playtime, it was fantastic. Mooncrash has a lot to go over, so instead of going into a long discussion about my thoughts, I need to explain what it's about. Mooncrash starts with us on a shuttle. Eventually, we discover that our name is Peter, and we work with a company called Chasma. They are a competitor of Transtar, and have tasked us with running this simulation. As per our contract details, we aren't finished until we accomplish all 27 tasks they have given us to do in the simulation. This simulation is of a scenario that is believed to have happened on the Transtar moon base Pythias, and where the majority of the content will be taking place. We are given five characters from the base, the volunteer, director, security officer, custodian, and engineer. The ultimate end goal is completing those 27 tasks Kazma has given us. The moon base is split into four sections. The main area is the crater that connects all the other three areas of the moon base, which are the Pythias Labs, Crew Annex, and the Moonworks. Each of these sections will be very important for completing this DLC. As for the rules of this DLC, it is a roguelike. Areas will be different and change every time you reset. For example, this one tunnel was blocked off in one run, but on the next it was gone. Also, when I say run, I mean simulation run. The simulation can be reset at any time you want for whatever reason, but when you reset the simulation, things will change. Everything you do as characters on the map will stay, but once you reset, you get put in a new version of the map. The best way to imagine it is if there were thousands of moon bases in front of you. Each of them has the same sections of the map and the same structures and floors, but each of them has small tiny details that set it apart from one another. One could have radiation in the crew annex, but another may not. When you reset the simulation, you're basically packing up and leaving to go to another moon base. It's not the greatest analogy, but hopefully that makes sense. Despite how it sounds, resetting is actually a very key part of the game, as the longer you're on the moon base, the higher your corruption level goes. Every level it goes up, the enemies will get stronger. Certain enemies that spawn on lower levels like Mimics or Phantoms will just be stronger versions of that enemy with a number next to them, but other Typhon like Weavers and Telepaths will only spawn on the higher corruption levels. If things get too hard, you can always reset and start back at corruption level 1. Since we have 5 characters, obviously the next question is which one is better, and there's actually no answer for this as all of them are different. Each of them has different health and energy levels, as well as what they start with and what abilities you can upgrade, which is why you need to use all of them because some of the challenges can only be completed with specific characters. The very last thing to go over is what resets, because at face value it sounds like a complete sweep of everything, but that's not entirely true. Any characters, challenges, and story objectives that are completed will stay forever. The other two things that stay are the known variables occurring in the moon base and any upgrades you unlock. I'll get to that first one later, but as for the latter, the neural mods in your inventory will disappear, but assuming you put them into any upgrade across any character, then they will stay permanently. So what does a typical playthrough of the DLC look like? At the beginning of a new run, you'll pick a character. At the very beginning, you'll only have the volunteer, but eventually you'll progress and unlock the other four. Just selecting your character, then you can pick the loadout using sim points. Sim points are earned by doing a ton of things. Escaping, killing enemies, or discovering dead bodies. Your loadout is based on the fabrication plans you've picked up in the world as well, so if you pick up the plan for making a silenced pistol, then you can buy one to put in your loadout. Once you select your loadout for guns, ammo, and chip sets, you start in a small room and are just left to do whatever you want. Since those 27 tasks do not have to be completed all at once, you can take your time completing them, or in some cases dedicate an entire run to one objective before resetting the simulation. It's recommended that you at least get the characters first, but the rest are entirely up to you. Moonbase has very similar things to Prey, so you'll find fabricators and recyclers, as well as security offices with all the crew members' locations. In the case of the security officer, to unlock him, you need to find his corpse on the moon base, so you could just go to a workstation and find where he died that way. Even though you don't get to keep your loadouts and are constantly resetting, the game still provides that option of player choice, just like the main game, albeit in a different way. Most of your choices will be planned out ahead of time, mapping out a route in your mind and what you want to accomplish, taking into account where to go, how to get there, and what to buy for the mission ahead. The rest is made up on the fly. Since things are random, you'll never know what'll happen. Sometimes an area you need to go to has no power, so instead of just going to that location, you need to make a quick pit stop to the crater and turn on the power. 
Like I said, the freedom to choose how you want to play is there, but it's just a little bit different this time around. As I said before, the goal is to complete all 27 objectives, and now that we've finally gotten the description out of the way, let's go over those objectives. They are split into four sections, crew members, escape attempts, story objectives, and discovery. The crew members are easy, as you just need to unlock the characters. The escape attempts encompass all the tasks involved with escaping, so you using every method, escaping with every character, and by far the hardest one, escaping using every character in one run. The story objectives are exactly as they sound. Each character has a story objective that needs to be completed in order to finish the game. To unlock this, you'll need to first unlock the character, then do the requirement at the bottom. So to unlock the security officer, we need to find his body on the moon base, which we already talked about. After searching it, he becomes a playable character. To unlock his story objective, we need to escape using the mass driver. Once that's done, we can then do his story objective and fully complete it. The last section, Discovery, is more of a mixed bag of things, where you discover all four sections of the moon base, do all five escape routes, scan five unique Typhon, find ten chipsets and fabrication plans, and finally install 50 neuromods across all the characters. I know that last one sounds really complex, but it's honestly not too bad. They mean 50 neuromods in total, so the engineer can have 49 and the volunteer has one and it will still count as a completion. Also, they really mean neuromods, not upgrades. Some upgrades can cost you 3 or 6 neuromods. Unlocking this wouldn't be 1 of 50, it'd be 3 or 6 out of 50, because that's how many neuromods it were needed to install it. These are all the objectives we need to complete so that we can finish the DLC. An idea that some players have done is to stock up on upgrades so that you can be extremely overpowered. Personally, I don't think it's necessary, but regardless, should you attempt to do this, you'll find out that the game still gets harder, and I'm not just talking about the corruption levels. After certain levels of progress, you'll surpass a threshold. This is when Peter gets shot out of the simulation to do some random task on the shuttle. Once you return, a note will appear before the next run that updates you on the simulation. These are extremely important as they can tell you what you already know and what is new. For example, early in the game, this random entity named the Moonshark will randomly appear in the game. He is extremely deadly and very similar to the Nightmare, however, after a couple runs, he'll be permanently there every time you come back. Not once have I started a run since he spawned where he wasn't there. This also goes for certain hazards. These aren't as specific, but the report just lets you know that they exist. If we go back to that early example, one of my runs had a radiation hazard at the crew annex. After a while, the idea became permanent. The radiation wasn't always at the crew annex, but the report was telling me that a hazard like radiation, fire, or no oxygen would appear in my games permanently from now on. This is where that randomness comes into play, so while I might not have the same hazard in the same location, a hazard will more than likely appear somewhere on the moon base. But by far the most annoying variable in this report is that the corruption level can be two times then three times as fast. This means I need to get things done faster than usual or I'll be dealing with enemies a lot quicker than I'd like. As hard as it sounds, this was extremely fun, as it made me constantly come up with better routes and ways of accomplishing my tasks while making the completion of those tasks really fun because they were hard. It made me feel rewarded for my effort, but it's clear from what I just described that this DLC is definitely an acquired taste. If anything I've said in the past 7 minutes sounds too hard or not your style, you're not going to like this DLC. However, if you are up for the challenge, you'll have a fantastic time with it. The story for this DLC, while light compared to the main game, still has the same good quality that the original storyline had. You don't get to learn too much about Peter, other than that he works for Kazma and was assigned to investigate what happened on the moon base. The other pieces of story we get are that he has a wife and daughter. The issue with this is I just felt no reason to care about him, as we didn't even really get to know why he was even here. But our five playable characters are much different. Each of them gets their own bit of background and story objectives so we can see what really happened. All five of them have names and are addressed in-game by their job title, so there's already established background information. The volunteer is a man named Andreas, who was just like the other volunteers on Talos 1 and was subjected to experiments. Because of this, he was able to master these new abilities he acquired, making him a dangerous yet intriguing subject. However, his story objective isn't as exciting. From his inner monologue, it seems that Andreas just wants to see his son again. Our first scene from the story objective is him being mind-controlled by a telepath. The telepath is pretending to be his son Alexei and tries to get Andreas to retrieve his toy for him. The game automatically shoots up to corruption level 4, but don't worry as none of the Typhon will attack you, only the operators. If you're starting to question how his son even got into the moon base, you're on the right track. 
Once we get his toy, we are then instructed to get inside the escape pod, and a certain thought starts to settle in until it's confirmed almost right away that the toy was just a mimic and Andreas was being deceived. The volunteers have always gotten the short stick of this game, and I was hoping for one happy ending, but that obviously didn't come. The next character is the director, Dr. Riley Yu. She's the cousin of both Alex and Morgan. Whereas Alex became the leader of Talos 1, she became the leader of the moon base. She also has the most unique way of escaping the moon base, which is uploading her consciousness to an operator, then presumably shooting that operator back to Transtar. Since she's the director and leader of the base, she's a very cold and by-the-books woman. She got mad at one of her colleagues for not addressing her as either Dr. Yu or Madam Director, so she clearly holds herself to a high esteem and her family's work reinforces that mentality. Her story objective is meeting with one of her other crewmates on the moon base during the outbreak and activating the Typhon Towers throughout the crater, completely eliminating any of the threat nearby, even the moon shark. Based on the timing of when this took place, it's assumed that she did the story objective first, then escaped by uploading her conscious, as opposed to Andreas, where the story objective was his escape. Vijay Bhatia is the chief of security at the moon base, and also our third playable character. He has somewhat of an easy job compared to the people back at Talos 1, since his base isn't 700 meters long. But I'd argue, in fact, that he has a much harder job than his colleagues, since he was told by Dr. Yu that there was a Chasma Mole in the base. Sometime earlier, he received the terrible news that his son was killed by Bengali pirates during a raid. In an attempt to hold back the emotional trauma he was going through, he tried to drink the pain away and ended up passing out. He awakes to hear a very upset Dr. Yu yelling at him about the Chasma spy named Claire Witten. She seems completely unfazed by the fact that there is an ongoing outbreak and still insists that he kills Claire before she escapes as she has some other things to deal with. Eventually, through some clues, we find the spy's hideout. When investigating her terminals, we are poisoned. The game then tries to sell us this option of stopping her but sacrificing ourself or saving our life but she goes free, except they gave us way too much time to do that, so you just end up doing both anyway. Once we reach the control tower, we can decide to intervene and blow up her shuttle or let it take off. Because we completed his story objective, we also unlocked the custodian, whose requirement was to be unlocked as VJ's story objective. I love the way this ties in together because Claire Witten is the custodian, but she's also the spy. She was a custodian on the moon base, but that wasn't her official title. I also love how they purposely gave her a broom for her idol animation, whereas when you unlock her, she gets the plasma cutter. It was a small yet great design decision to keep her identity a secret until the very end. Claire's story objective starts with her stabbing some Transtar personnel before being contacted by Basilisk from Chasma that her identity has been made. Her instructions are then to destroy all the listening devices and plant her her command key and Dr. Yu's operator, then escape. But it's a nice little neat touch that all the listening devices can't just be shot, they have to be recycled. After finishing our task, Kazma promised to extract her, but they said it'd be too costly to do that, so she needed to escape on her own. Our very last character is Joan the Engineer. She's an extremely skilled technician and actually comes with a spawnable turret to help her fight. Her story objective starts with her killing a man with a wrench. We discover that she was in a relationship with a man named Brian Chung. She was trying to find out what happened to him, but the man she killed, Ken, wouldn't tell her. It may seem strange to resort to violence like this, but an early transcribe can provide context to what we're about to uncover. In the same room that we stopped Claire's shuttle as VJ, a transcribe between Ken and Joan is found, and it's discovered that because of the combined construction in the moonworks and the constant rumbling in the caves, Joan was mining some rocks and a large piece fell on Brian. Ken promised to deliver him to the trauma center and get him some help, except Ken had other plans, as he had previously worked with another employee called Diana and owed her a favor. She cashed in the favor, and Ken gave her Brian so she can run tests on him. The results of those tests are that he is a phantom. So now things are starting to make just a little bit more sense. After discovering this, she went to Brian's quarters to find a bird that he was sculpting for her and decided to put it on the finished statue he was going to make of her. It's a really sweet and depressing tale. All of these stories are wonderful, as it shows that there was actual things going on within the moon base. It also managed to tie in other characters, giving context to other actions and further providing more story content for us to uncover. The question still remains though, what actually happened, and we really don't know. We do know some concrete details, but the rest are up to interpretation. To explain, we also need to discuss the five escape routes. Seeing as there's only five characters and five escape routes, it starts to settle in that only one escape is allowed per character, which is why that last objective of doing it all in one run is all the more difficult. The first option is the shuttle, and this is by far the easiest one to complete. All you need to do is get the data to pilot the shuttle, and a neuromod to become a pilot, and you can fly off the moon base. A similar one to 
to this is the escape pod. Due to the convenience of escape pods, many of them are gone, in fact, only one of them is left. You'll have to check which location has the last one before hopping in and escaping. Later, the game will require you to use installation keys, which is a whole other objective, except I never did that because I just purchased them in my loadout. Moving on up in difficulty is the mass driver. This is a storage bin that's usually filled with cargo, but you're going to launch yourself to Earth with this. To survive the trip, you need some food, water, and some anti-rads, which once again can either be purchased ahead of time or found pretty much anywhere on the base. After putting in the food, you need to activate the mass drive from the control tower, then sprint all the way down before it takes off without you. Our fourth option is uploading our consciousness. This can only be done by Dr. Yu and is the only escape with a required character. To do this, we need to visit Dr. Yu's computer and contact Alex. From here, we need to upload some data to this operator before we put ourselves in the chair, except the data is incomplete. To get this data, we need to summon a phantom using the Phantom Genesis ability, once again an ability only available to Dr. Yu. After we scan it and compile the data, we can set up the operator and upload our consciousness, except we don't. Remember when I said we had to put Claire's key in the operator? Well, this comes into play as it actually kills Dr. Yu. I think this is how the DLC started, as the operator we used to start the simulation with Peter has the command key inside of it already. Our very last escape is easy, but requires a lot of setup, and that's the Mimic Portal. For some reason, a Mimic keeps teleporting shoes from Earth, and the researchers before the attack were trying to figure out why. To us, we don't care, as it's a way off the moon. To complete this, we need to hack the computer, as there's no password available, then repair the actual chamber before stabilizing it, then jumping through. The problem is we need the hack and repair skill. Claire's the only character in the game who can hack, and Joan is the only one who can repair, so this requires at least two people to do, and becomes one of the biggest hurdles in the final objective. So with all the information out there, what happened? Like I said, there isn't much concrete info, but from what I can gather, Dr. Yu uploaded her consciousness and died thanks to Claire, which means Claire was discovered as the mole and completed her story objective. In fact, I think all these people completed their story objectives, except maybe Vija. Depending on your choice, it can seem that Claire killed Dr. Yu, Vija killed Claire, then Vija died somewhere later. Vija's story objective has different ways of ending it, so this is the one that is up to interpretation. We do know from a transcribe that he possibly died from a moon shark since he was being attacked by one before it stopped recording, however that doesn't explain how he ended up inside here. This is probably my main gripe with the entire story with the moon base, is that it's intertwined with so many different options that coming up with a plausible ending doesn't even seem possible. As opposed to the story though, the gameplay was well worth the effort. I had multiple notebook pages of ideas and notes written down during the entire playthrough and one whole page dedicated to doing the final run. Since there were five characters and five escapes, one character would be assigned to each escape, but minus Dr. Yu and her consciousness, everything else can be done by anyone, meaning people won't have the same ending as everyone else. This is actually my main gripe with Deathloop, as the final run for the game was the exact same one as everyone else's and could not be changed, but Mooncrash, even in its final moments, allows for that player choice. So the first thing to consider is who goes to what escape and in what order. It's also important to remember that any hazard or variable the game throws at me will probably screw up my entire plan, so I need to also make sure the run isn't down to the letter. After like 20 minutes of writing, my plan went as follows. I started as the custodian and ran to the Pythias labs to hack the computer. Afterwards, she would then run to the crew annex and take the shuttle. I could have also taken the escape pod, but that was another random variable I would need to get out of the way, and wanted to get going as soon as possible. After the custodian, we moved to the engineer and finished the mimic portal. Before doing so, she'll check to make sure where the last pod is for the volunteer, then hop inside the portal. I got super lucky that the pod was also in Pythias, so I just made my way there with the installation key and hopped in the pod and left. Even though the volunteer has 75 health, he has a ton of evasive tactics like going underground temporarily, so I wasn't too worried about the difficulty. My biggest fear was up next as Dr. Yu would then upload her consciousness. I planned on going to the lounge just underneath her office because of the plethora of food and drinks in the room. I could then use the robot companion given to all the characters earlier in the game to transfer for my items to everyone when I needed to. I also thought that since Dr. Yu goes past the mass driver for her escape objective, I could just drop off the food on the way, but apparently once you get the data from the Phantom the first time, you'll never need it again, which was quite bizarre. I didn't know if this was intended or a glitch, and it definitely really didn't help my decision when the device for the operator never appeared until after placing it, so I thought I bugged my game out. Still, I was coasting around corruption level 2 and I was feeling uber confident, and it still ended up working out okay as I placed the items in, immediately activated the driver, then shot Vija to space. This whole sequence took around 40 minutes, including the actual gameplay and the planning ahead of time, and it was some of the most
most exhilarating gameplay I've experienced in a long time. It was probably the most fun I've had playing this entire game. After this is completed, you're most likely finished with every other objective. With all of our objectives complete, we can finally talk to Kazuma about our contract, and now is a good time to talk about Peter's story. Mooncrash's story is best described as okay. It's not mind-blowing, but it's not terrible either. Because the simulation takes priority, we don't get to see Peter too much besides the times we hop out of the simulation. Those first few times we do hop out of the simulation, we're just told to do some random task, like fixing something or putting something away. Eventually, we will overhear a conversation between Basilisk and a director of Chasma named Teddy. It seems that Teddy is going to do what they did to Claire and leave us to die when we're done with our contract. So instead, Basilisk helps us by instructing us to set aside an oxygen tank just in case. This comes in handy as when we finish, Teddy does exactly what we thought and attempts to suffocate us. So we grab the oxygen tank and go to the command console in the vents of the shuttle. Sadly, after trying every option, we're only able to decommission the ship and crash it into the moon, which Peter does. Surprisingly though, he is alive and after leaving the rubble of his shuttle, he finds a potential way off the moon before the credits roll. But not too fast, we are playing Prey after all, and once again get another post credit scene that plays the sound of ocean waves and seagulls, which applies Peter made it to Earth, but as you probably expected, another mimic also made it to Earth, since on the dashboard is a duplicate of his daughter's toy. Mooncrash ends on a cliffhanger like Prey, as we don't really know what happens afterwards, but given the ending of the story, it's more than likely it leads to the Typhon attack on Earth. As a whole, Mooncrash is one of the best DLCs I've played in a long time, and despite the DLC being completely different in gameplay as the main game, it was honestly just as fun. Most DLCs are a continued storyline with the same mechanics. This is seen in just about 99% of DLC, and there's nothing wrong with that. If people enjoy the gameplay of the main story, they're obviously going to like the DLCs as they're the same. But Arcane took yet again another risk in doing this, and at least for me, it was worth it. The same cannot be said for others, however, as completing the DLC is an achievement that only 0.24% of players on Xbox have completed. Even getting all the five characters was an achievement 0.43% of players completed. I know Xbox's achievement percentage isn't always perfect, but that means that an overwhelming amount of players didn't even buy the DLC, and even the ones that did, didn't make it very far. The DLC seemed to suffer a similar fate to the main game, and it's mostly the reason the DLC didn't gain any traction, cause who the hell buys a game only to play the DLC. I understand that Mooncrash's gameplay is not everyone's cup of tea, but just like the main game, I still wish it got more attention. Finally though, we've made it to the outro. Thank you all for making it this far in the video. Prey is a game that despite its flaws deserved more recognition than it got. While I am a part of that problem since I didn't buy the game on launch, I guess I'm still kind of doing my part by sharing my experience with all of you. If it wasn't obvious by the length, I had a lot to say about Prey, and a lot of that was good things that I really enjoyed about the game, like its exploration, the ending, and its DLC. Regardless, thank you for taking time out of your day to watch to the end of the video. And if you did, let me know if you've played a Prey or not in the comments down below and whether or not you you enjoyed the game yourself. As always, like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe if you're new. If you want to see more video essays like this, I encourage you to check out my other videos like the one on Fallout New Vegas. If you want to watch some other style of content, then you could watch my recent reviews on both Riders Republic and Far Cry 6. To my returning viewers, thank you for always coming back, and with that everyone, take care and goodbye.